the Biennale and the South Beverly community would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose land we recorded these conversations, the Bidjigal people and Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to Elders past and present and extend our respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from all nations of this land. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander listeners are warned that the following podcast may contain images and voices of deceased persons. I'm Grant Mayling, a Bidjigal man from La Perouse, and this is the Niran podcast series. Niran is the 22nd Biennale of Sydney. It's a First Nation-led exhibition that challenges dominant narratives and provides paths to healing. This is a podcast about our connection to place. In this episode, Clarence Slocky educates us about native plants, how to incorporate them in the kitchen, and why growing them is a sustainable solution. Clarence Slocky is a Bundjalung man who loves the bush. Clarence likes to bring technology and Indigenous knowledge together and see how those two things talk to one another. He has broad experience as a cultural and environmental educator, delivering a range of programs and community-based projects. Clarence is also an expert advisor of the 22nd Biennale to artists such as Andrew Rewald and Kylie Kwong, educating them about land management and helping them better understand the changing climate. Today, Clarence likes to hold music events and shake cocktails with native plants in Everly on the South Everly rooftop farm, where we are currently recording this conversation. Clarence, thanks so much for having us on the, this beautiful garden rooftop. Firstly, can you describe the, the garden for us? Um, well, it's just a, a green roof, I suppose, in some ways. But the interesting thing about this one is it's, uh, it's 100% native. So using native species to you know, you know, beautify and, and green what is a, a fairly uh, solid um, con- yeah. concrete jungle, I suppose, in some ways. How many plants are actually on the roof? Um, I'll give or take about 2,500 at the moment. Wow. Yeah. How has the garden practiced uh, Aboriginal environmental land management? Or I guess, I guess it still is practicing. Uh, in some ways, it's the like the environmental sustainability messaging is the fact that we've chosen all native species. Mm. So, by and large, it's using way less water than you would normally have on a on a green roof or any garden for that matter. Um, a lot of gardens have um, have plants for you know they're there for their aesthetic appeal. So. And they might be exotics that have you know, beautiful yeah, flowers, yeah. but they they also need a lot of water. They need a lot of care. They need a lot of nutrient. They need so by using the natives, we've we've come into a, a space where we you know we don't really have to um, you know well we do have to care for them, but we we, we certainly don't need as, as much water. We don't need the nutrient level. The, the, it, it automatically brings down the the um, amount of effort and energy that goes into the the roof. But then, I guess from an Aboriginal perspective, it's it's um, added to the the fact that there's a few of the species that we are growing here are um, from environmentally sensitive areas. Mm-hmm. So if we can take the heat out of um, you know the, the, those plant communities that yeah. people might be out there harvesting, yeah. then if we can show that you can grow them elsewhere, yeah. then hopefully those environmentally sensitive areas remain intact and people can then you know, look at growing things elsewhere. Uh, now, you were saying that it's 100% native, so obviously that would mean a number of unique plants up here. So can you name some of them and tell us what they do? Yeah, I guess the, well, not so unique really if you get out in the bush, but yeah. I, I guess the, the, the uniqueness of it is the fact that they're on a roof. That's the, yeah. that's the really unique part because um, you know, we weren't sure how they were gonna, gonna react to being this high up. This is, a, this is about the height that you get a lot of pollinators at. So, so we're four stories off the ground, just so, you know, we are on radio, not television, so people yeah. can't see what we're looking at. But um, yeah, four floors up, it, uh, it's about the limit for pollinators, uh, the insects that, that are coming up to, to um, do the thing with the, with the uh, flowers that are here. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the, by the same token, it's, a, uh, you know, it's very windy. You know, we, it's, um, we've had about 100 k's an hour up here, yeah. wow. which has had a pretty big impact. But um, the plants that we, we chose, uh, are, you know, a lot of them are from out west. Um, from down in um, South Australia, out towards Broken Hill, like there's a, it's a fairly broad range of native species that are up here, so they're really adapted to that really harsh climate, so they're doing quite well. Um, you've obviously got quite a lot of knowledge about the, uh, the plants and the plants around Australia, I imagine, and I guess where did that all start from? Where did you learn all of that? 
Um, a lot of it was growing up, just you know, spending a lot of time in the bush with cousins and uncles and aunties and growing up on farms. Um, my parents are still farming, my brother's are <laughs> farms. He looks after the family farm, funnily yeah. enough. Um, my, uh, my sister and her partner have got 100 acres of organic, so it's, it's, yeah, I guess it's in the blood. A lot of, lot of my family, family immediate and, and broader family are all still connected to country. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, it's just a, you know, I think it's innate in, in most of us as, as First Nations people having a connection to particular parts of country and particular plants that yeah, we, we know about and we, we've spent time with. So um, add to that the fact that I, I worked at the Botanic Gardens for quite some time and I was really fortunate to have colleagues who are way more knowledgeable than yeah. I am. And uh, I were, I'm a bit of a sponge when it comes to learning new things. So it was just you know the perfect location to learn, yeah, yeah to, to, to learn about plants. You know, like some of the best botanists in the country, you know, yeah. like um, crazy, um, job titles like you know um, uh, evolutionary ecologists and ethnobotanists floral botanists all of these things yeah, yeah. Ooh, what are they? yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a really really uh, interesting to, to, to meet people like that but to also be able to share knowledge yeah that's it now let's take a quick change of pace uh, and how do you think colonization has affected uh, indigenous Australians connection to the land oh man that's a hard question yeah. to answer it's um Look, you only have to look at the what's happened with the the fires not that long ago. You know, like the, they were just so hard, so hot, and just so crazy. And a lot of that is, um, in 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 some ways, due to that that discounting of Aboriginal cultural knowledge. In some ways, yeah. it's like you know, the, the the bureaucratic process seems to tie things up a lot, and it makes it really difficult for people to actually to access country, mm-hmm. to get out on country, to practice culture, to help in you know, giving people a, a, an understanding but also an appreciation of, of our culture but how, how you know, different Aboriginal peoples have managed this, this continent for thousands of years. So the, the colonisation in particular, apart from, you know, the, there are areas up, up home where there, there's photos of, of just entire valleys ring barked so that they could get rid of the trees yeah. so they could have just grass for cattle and things like that so there's been you know massive deforestation over yeah. you know the last 200 plus years but then add to that all the the you know the agricultural practices that we have the the issues that we have around water you know there's a whole lot of things that make it very difficult for aboriginal people to keep that connection to country yeah. when we see what's happening and you know the the, the, a lot of the elders who you know, I'm sure have the, a deeper um, knowledge and understanding seeing what, what's happening, it, it is quite heartbreaking. And I imagine that would have had a, a massive impact on, I mean, you sort of touched on it then, on the species of, uh, of flora and fauna that we ha- will have and also had. Some of them have, ex- uh, have been extinct. So what, what are some of those? Uh, look, it, it's really interesting. Actually, the, I, I got to know a fair bit about it when I was at the gardens because of the... Um, you know, the, uh, 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 not wanting to pick, pick sides, but you know, f- soft and cuddly furry animals always get the run of um, you know threatened species and and um, at risk and 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 extinct species. Um, whereas we've lost over 200 plant species yeah. in the last 200 years. So that like every year a plant species goes extinct. So so it's really you know that in itself is it, is really quite alarming because the. You know, as, as sad as it is for all of our, our fauna, and it's going to be very hard again to recover from what's just happened not long ago, but the it, it, you know, Aboriginal people have, have known for thousands of years that the connection, you know, our connection is the connection to country, but also the connection to all of the animals, the birds, the plants, everything. We're all connected and we all have a responsibility and we all have a role to play within what you know, is now known as a, you know, e- e- ecology or an ecosystem. The biodiversity is the key key for that healthy ecosystem yeah. if, if if there's no biodiversity if you've only, you know if you lose 10 species out of a, a, a ecosystem of 100 that's going to have a long-term impact yeah. and a long-term effect but and unfortunately we we're, we're not quite there is seeing what's happening with that loss of, of biodiversity. Uh, a lot of the plants that did go extinct were types of food that, that people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people you have used over those thousands of years. So uh, can, you, can you tell us about some of those? Um, well, look, there's a lot that are still threatened. Um, the Uncle Bruce Pascoe spoke a lot about the, um, the uh, yam daisy. 
um, and, and that almost went extinct. Um, it's being brought back now. A lot of lot of people are getting into. We're we're growing it here on the roof actually, and then you know, every time it, it seeds, we're giving seed away to people just so that we can <laughs> get the stock up and get people to grow them elsewhere, yeah, and yeah, you know, yeah. trying to right. trying to yeah. get as much out there as again. Um, yeah, the um, Sydney Harbour, for example, is there's a few seaweed species that that no longer um, exist. So there's a you know people often forget about the plants that are in the ocean, but they you know, they they provide a lot of our oxygen so there's a there's a whole you know range of plants that people you know things like fungi algae all the all yeah. the all the little things that you know again form part of the the, yeah, the, bigger, the, picture. the bigger picture um you know they mightn't be as sexy as a koala but they <laughs> you know, they, they need to be looked after <laughs> <laughs> a lovely way of putting it. I like that. Uh, let's get back to the, the farm now. Um, it, it's as we were saying earlier. It's a way of connecting technology and um, and basically flora and fauna. So, how does it? How do those two inter intertwine? Um, the interesting thing here is that we're as as I said earlier, we're, we're up quite high, but we're we're seeing a lot of insects come in, and we we don't use any chemicals on the roof. Um, it's you know they're all native species, so yeah, they 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 do handle the conditions quite well. Um, but you know, we we don't we use a little bit of liquid fertilizer. We've got worm farms, so we're churning through. Um, food. You've got worm farms up here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. yeah so we use, we're taking food organics from the cafes around the around the space, oh, and okay. we're churning that into into um, worm castings and liquid fertilizer. So we're we're using that um, for the plants. We're not um, spraying. We're, we're using permaculture principles in. Um, relation to encouraging pollinators to come up, We're, um, we've just kind of come towards the end of the wasp um, season. So the wasps were coming up in, in droves to, to nest and have their babies, and they were keeping um, all of the caterpillars in check. So yeah. the, you know, like you, you, you lose a little bit here and there, but it's not, you know, it, it, it all works out in the end. The really, really cool thing here is that there's a, a, we've got a heap of spiders now who have just been flying in on the wind. Yeah, and just, yeah. Uh, like I mean, uh, that's really uh, terrifying. <laughs> they're not the ones that are going to kill you. <laughs> 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 was, all, was all of that, I guess, thought out and, and, and planned in the design process or has it sort of just evolved? Oh, it's look, it, it, our, um, our project manager in particular, and, and, uh, and my background's a, a lot in the permaculture space because it, it aligns really well with, with Aboriginal land management um, principles. So um, our, our project managers had been, had been doing um, permaculture gardens in schools. And so, we, you know, between the, the, he and I, we, we really wanted to make sure that we had a, a really broad um, plant palette that was going to allow for the biodiversity and, and that's been the really encouraging thing just seeing not only the numbers of, of insects that are coming up here but just the the variety of insects so you know um, things from the native um, sugar bag bees to teddy bear bees blue banded bees yellow banded bees all of the wasps that are coming up the spiders as i mentioned so we're getting all these really really interesting um, insects coming in and as a consequence then you get the birds coming in we had a little wren that was that was here for a couple of days just hanging out in the raspberry so uh, it's a um, it is really quite encouraging given where where we are um, but you know, if you look look south there is a, a nice tree canopy through the, the houses as well so you know, it's a little bit of a hop skip and a jump for all of the, yeah. the different animals and insects but um, you know given that we're surrounded by buildings it's just a nice little oasis yeah so I imagine there's a, a, a whole host of, uh, of reasons that this is this plan management plan is relevant firstly for rehabilitation but also for showing people that there are other places that these can go yeah, and that's the that, that's the thing. Like, there's one one plant in particular, which is uh, this is one on the on the table here. The um, down south they call it um, Kakala, um, yeah, but that's just one language name, as you can imagine. But the um, it's a beautiful um, little succulent that goes really well in salads, mm -hmm. um, and it it grows in the Kuyong, which is really you know, quite a an environmentally sensitive area again. But yeah. the the fact that you know this is um, this is used by a lot of chefs now and to be able to come and get it from a, you know, literally from up the road from your restaurant yeah. is a lot better than having it, you know, somebody go out into the Kuyo and wild harvest it, yeah. package it, send it on a plane, yeah. comes from Adelaide to Sydney and then, yeah. that, so it's all of, all of those wraparound things in the supply chain bringing down the environmental footprint. And I imagine there's a number of different um, plant species out there that you can eat, not just this one. 
Oh yeah, there's heaps. We've, we've got a lot of lot of things out there just for their flowers. Yeah. Um, again, for the biodiversity and encouraging pollinators in here. But you know, by and large, there's out of the um, probably I think we're up to about forty species now. Out of the forty species, you can eat about twenty five, yeah. maybe thirty. Yeah. How does incorporating these species and this native diet in, or into your diet, I should say, how does that, uh, I guess, improve our carbon footprint? Um, well, I would prefer to see people grow grow their own food at home. Yeah, and I guess in some ways, the the it, you know, interesting thing, this is you know, if you think of this roof as a, as a big balcony, it, yeah. it it kind of gives people that that you know because a lot of people in the cities now do live in apartments, so give them a little bit of um, hopefully inspiration for you know I have a small space, yeah. I've just got a balcony, can't really do anything, but well. you you can. Yes, there's you know, there's a few things that we'll, we'll do, and these are some of them. You can just you know you can grow some of these. The the warrior greens that I mentioned earlier, they they, they make a great pesto. So you know it's really really easy to grow. Um, you know it has to be prepped before you you make the pesto, but it's it's a really good alternative, and it, and it's um, it's high in vitamin C. So there's a there's a whole heap of, of plants that can be used as substitutes, but also they you know the the fact that you know if you can grow them, you know in your backyard or on your balcony you're cutting down the environmental footprint yeah. of the food production similarly we've had um you know also saving money i imagine yeah well that's the other <laughs> yeah. bonus but the you know look, we've, had, we've 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 um, partnered with a few different restaurants and cafes and it's just it's really nice that the chefs can come up here and just you know grab a basket of things that they need and then yeah. they, you know literally walk or ride to their restaurant like, yeah it's so cool if i was to come over to, we're going to go hypothetical here yes. if i was to come over to your house have a cup of tea. What type of herbs and, and, and little things that you, what do you, what's in your garden? Oh, well, my, my garden's pretty, pretty um, spread out actually, because I, yeah. I, I, you know, I grow a lot of, a lot of um, kitchen herbs and, you know, the, the standard thyme and sage and rosemary for the, the roast lambs and things, but the, um, the, you know, certainly the, the salt bush. Yeah. Um, yeah the, That's from South Australia. Um, and Western New South Wales. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. right. So this is this is used a lot um, now that now in particular because the, um, the saltbush lamb you probably you know, I've had saltbush um they have I, I used to live in South Australia and there was yeah. an ice cream that was saltbush flavoured and it was ah. it was interesting to yeah, say yeah. the least. Well it's <laughs> like yeah. what was it? No, there's been some crazy uh, yeah, salted caramel um, mm, ice cream. Something yeah. like that, yeah. yeah. But so the, the cool thing about saltbush is that you can dehydrate this and, okay. and the, the salt bush flakes are quite literally a, a herb that you can use instead of salt. Right. So it's a really, um, it's a really quite a good, and going back to Kylie Kwong, she does a fantastic um, pork dumpling, pork and salt bush dumpling. No way. The, yeah, yeah, so there's, there's, there's <laughs> lots, of, lots of different uses for, for some of the things that, that you might see at my house, but by and large, I've got, you know, I've got a couple of big lily pilly trees and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, they, they've just fruited their heads off this year, which has been fantastic. So I'm one of the few people in the neighbourhood that, that actually uh, goes out and forages and, and harvests all the, all the street trees and you know, the neighbours just think, who is this guy? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> So you've already mentioned a number of plants that we can uh, cook with and use at home, but I imagine there's a whole host more. So is there any others of your favourites? Uh, well, I have picked a selection here and we'll, we'll see if we can take some photos. I don't know how we're going to attach this to the podcast. We'll give it a crack. Yeah. Um, but the prosnanthras, which is this, it's got this gorgeous little flower. Oh, that is pretty. Um, but there's, uh, you know, the, if we had... Um, smell of vision or some form of uh, radio wave that could get the, the um, scent out there. You, you can smell just how, how solid that is. As yeah, a, wow. as a, that's a bush mint. Okay. So that's, um, a, a lot of the old people would use that if they had an upset stomach or they, oh, yeah. they're having trouble um, with their digestive system. So it's, it makes a really good um, tea. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, a lot of these, uh, so the mint, our, our native mint, mm -hmm. um, or mint plural, this is a river mint. So oh, that smells. Yeah, so it's a... It's quite an interesting uh, smell. Yeah, that's super strong. If actually, if you have a have a just bite a bite a leaf but off and give it. A <laughs> <laughs> it's very strong. Very strong. You just, sorry, that okay, was a, that was a very big whiff of it. Mhm. So it's like it's yeah wow yeah. oh it's like stinging my tongue. It's yeah, so it's strong. Su it's super mint. Yeah, yeah. so the, our um. Our, our, our native mint is pretty solid. It tastes like a like a fisherman's friend. It's so like strong. <laughs> I should have warned you ahead I'm of time. I'm just trying to get the listeners a visual. <laughs> so there's a couple other things that I've got here on, on the plate. And these are, um, again, these are 
Oh, there oh, we wow. go. These are um, little rainforest plums. It looks like a blueberry almost. Yeah, well, they're a little um, bit bigger. The, I'll, I'll give you a heads up. Do you like warheads? Uh, I, yeah, I yeah. guess. Because I'll give you, a, I'll give you a little heads up. You don't, you, don't, it... you don't have to eat the whole thing, but I'll give you. <laughs> so, so the rainforest, <laughs> rainforest plum. I feel like I'm yeah, on some sort of just give a, TV show. Oh, oh my god! It's like, ugh, yeah. <laughs> Holy wow! That's very sour. Oh yeah, but the the, the reason that's so sour is mm -hmm. because it's it's um, really high in vitamin C. Okay. And antioxidants. Oh, and I mean, it's I did thing. warn you. Yeah, no. You, <laughs> when you were warning me, I was like, it's a like it's a berry. What do you mean? It's like, oh wow! Uh, but the um, but that's the that's the that's the really interesting thing about uh, a lot of our. A lot of our bush foods, they, they're just, you know, they're, they're now, you know, that whole, I'm not really into the term, but they, they refer to them as um, superfoods. Mm -hmm. Now, for those people that are listening, if that, some of them might live in Sydney, but some might be just visiting and some might even not, not be in Sydney. But where are some places that you can, uh, that you can purchase these, these uh, fantastic tasting plants? <laughs> well, you should really be growing them yourself because mm -hmm. they are really hard to get some of these. Well, where do you get um, the seeds from? But uh, look, there, there, are some, there are some really um, amazing people. Um, Sharon with Indigi Earth, the, you know, the, a, lot, a lot of the, the, um, the Aboriginal entrepreneurs out there in the bush food space are, are really mindful of the, the cultural protocols and all of the, 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 you know, the ethical sourcing of, of the, the bush foods, yeah. um, which, is, which is great, which is not to say that non-Indigenous people aren't doing that, but um, you know, the people that I know that are working in the space are, are doing the right thing around, you know, Communities where they source it, making sure they're you know paying the paying the right money, all that type of thing. Yeah. So that's a, that's one thing to be mindful of. But a lot of the um, a lot of these the you know the, these rainforest plums, for example, um, we've been growing here. So yeah, yeah the warheads exactly. But um, you know you won't get a cold, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Incredibly so. <laughs> Oh, All right, uh, let's move on to the You're obviously involved in the Twenty Second Biennale. So, I guess, what is your involvement? What's going on? Um, it was really just, just uh, as you said, um, working with people like Andrew Rewald and, and Kylie Kwong in, in the work that they're doing. And um, uh, uh, Andrew uh, is doing a, an installation of, of plants, and uh, you know, he's, he lives up my way, mm -hmm. um, my home country anyway. Yeah. And um, uh, he's a, a really cool guy who does some amazing installs. And um, I, I, only saw, I saw it when he, when he planted it up, so I'm really looking forward to yeah. the, the finished product. Yeah. In so far, you know, it's 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 interesting because a lot of lot of artists who who do if they work in sculptural work or or they work in in public art spaces, you kind of see the process. You know, there's a start and a finish. Yeah. He he has to plan so far ahead because it's it's a living piece yeah, because okay. it's all plants. So yeah. so he yeah he planted months ago. Oh, so okay. and I and I've, I've purposely been holding off because I saw the. I saw what it looked like when it went in, yeah. and you know he, he came came here and we we worked you know, worked through some of the plants he was he was looking to to put into the space, yeah. and then um, you know he uh, yeah, I'm re really keen to see what That's what it looks favorites. like now. Yeah, yeah. Um, similarly with Kylie, she she'll be doing a few um, a few of her um, pieces here um, on the roof, and then yeah, we're we'll, uh, you know, tying again tying food culture. Um, and you know, Aboriginal land management into the the, the, the art space. Mm, that's it. Yeah. So I guess how are these those two in particular, but I guess the other things you're working on in Biennale different to some other stuff you've done over your what 20, 30 year career, something like that. <laughs> Don't remind me. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting. Yeah, you know, having having been in, in the arts um, through dance and music in particular, um, but you know, knowing a lot of, of visual artists and, and um, performers, it. it uh, it's 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 nice to to really just be in the background and just just letting letting people do their thing, and you know just helping out if they need need anything. You know, that's really I've I've got a really limited role, which is great. You know, normally normally yeah, this, yeah yeah man. All those uh, all those some of those those big big uh, they will be and Ali's huge as you as you know, and and it's nice to just. You know, be on the on the periphery, so to speak. So yeah. you can go and enjoy the enjoy the art as opposed to you know freaking out about not having your your, your uh, project ready yeah. on time or you know where am I going to get thousands of you know, the, 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 yeah a thousand plants? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and why is it important to educate artists and I guess others as well about connections to country? 
I think, look, as a as an Aboriginal follow, I'm, you know, even though I live in Sydney, I'm, I'm connected to, still connected to my my own country, mm. um, but I have a, a really strong affinity and appreciation for um, the East Coast in particular. And it's you know, living in Sydney, we're, we're, we are spoiled to. You, know, you can go into the Blue Mountains, you can go up to the Central Coast, you can go like Karingai, for example, the, the heads, like the, the harbour is just stunning. There's, a, you know, the Royal National Park, we're, we're surrounded by this beautiful bushland. And I think everyone, um, you know, whether you've, 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 you know, first or second generation um, Australian or you've, you've literally just arrived in the country, I think everyone needs to develop an affinity and a connection so that we can have a, a, a not only a deeper understanding but a, a, a greater sense of uh, responsibility for caring for country. Aboriginal people have it and we've had it for thousands of years and Doris Strait Islander people have it. But you know, the broader Australian public, there are a lot of people who have a connection to country because they, you know, they, they feel that affinity, you know, and they and they feel that connection. Um, you know, that's a great thing to be able to have spread that out. I think you know, the the more people can connect to country and connect with Aboriginal people and and get an understanding of what it's like for you know, particularly our, our elders, the things that they've had to to go through and the things they're still going through just to you know, yeah. be able to be who they are and, and to be proud of uh, you know, what we have. It, you know, we're the oldest living culture on the planet that's got to count for something. Thank you so much for your time today and telling us about all the native plants and, uh, and how you're getting involved with Niren. And thank you for uh, coming up and enjoying the space and um, for uh, your kind words, but also uh, you know, being kind to me in the uh, questioning. <laughs> Work too hard, thank you. The 22nd Biennale is open from the 14th of March to the 8th of June. For more information, visit biennaleofsydney.art.